back on the plant, Steve. Okay, um, next up we have uh, Adtrans Director for Strategic Planning, but also the Regional CTO for EMA and APAC, um, Ronan Kelly. Uh, Ronan has been with Adtrans since uh, 2010. Um, but also serves as the current president of the Fibre to the Home Council in Europe, um, which is obviously a very influential body, uh, particularly involved in the debates that we've been going through today. So I'll hand straight over to Ronan. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. So good morning, everyone. Um, today, the topic of my talk is Gigabit Society. Is it a vision or is it a mirage? Um, I want to touch on a few points. I'm not going to focus too much on technology. I think we've heard a lot about technology today. Really what I want, what I want is to think about are some of the drivers, some of the forces that are shaping the market out there and pushing society towards gigabit. Within my role, as Matt mentioned, you know, today I'm very firmly here in the capacity of Atran CTO for me and APAC, but some of the other hats that I wear within the industry, like um, heading up the Fiber of the Home Council for Europe, gives me exposure to a lot of different markets around Europe to get deep insight into what's driving those markets, how they're being successful with different technologies. So what I wanted to do was try and share that with you today. Um, if we kick off with the market forces, there we go. Um, I'll start off with the government market forces, and this is really what drives the push within the market. If we look at what's happening now in Europe, particularly within the EU Commission, we've got a shot there on the screen from Commissioner Oettinger, who started off one of the big initiatives that's driving across Europe at the moment and is being heavily debated. And that's basically the next electronic communications code for Europe. And what that's really doing is it's moving us past the 2020 targets that saw 30 megabits for all and 100 megabits taken up by 50% of the population. And it's now moving us towards 100 megabits for every European citizen with an upgrade path to gigabit. And also, in addition to that, we also see, you guys, there's a problem with the clicker here get tricky, I don't know if the batteries are low. Um, we also see within the electronic community, communications code is that gigabit connectivity. Every socioeconomic driver, um, be that a transport hub, be it a university, be it a library or a school, your local pub or restaurant, your hospital, um, hotels, you name it, every single place of work must be connected via gigabit connectivity. Uh, by 2025. So that means over the next seven or so years, we're going to see approximately 10 to 15 percent of premises connected with gigabit connectivity. So think about what the implications are for that for consumers. First of all, it's going to drive a massive densification of fiber out there. Secondly, it's going to get consumers exposed to much higher speeds, which is going to begin to set expectations. So when I go down to the pub and I can get gigabit connectivity down the pub, and then I go home and I'm on a couple of meg, am I going to be satisfied? Most likely not. We also have competitive forces within the market. And this slide here talks about what happens when a market that's ripe for disruption is faced with a disruptor of significant means. So you see behind me there a little blue dot and it refers to Google Fiber. And what this slide talks about is what happened to the market when Google Fiber entered and started to offer gigabit service rates at consumer price points. And what I mean by consumer price points was sub $80 for a gigabit of connectivity. Now prior to that, gigabit was the preserve of large enterprise. Large enterprise directly connected on fiber, paying thousands per month. Now all of a sudden you have a, a disruptor entering the market offering it for 80 bucks a month. And if you look at how the, the, the operator community reacted to that, we see a massive influx of other operators in different cities. Most of these on this, on this slide are from the US. You see a few European mentioned ones in there as well, now beginning to offer gigabit services as well. If we look at the US market today, all the major tier one service providers in the US are now offering gigabit services for less than 80 bucks a month. We also have a similar following now in the European markets as well, where they're pushing through with that. So that com competition that's stirring up between the operator community, particularly where you've got solid infrastructure-based competition, can really catalyze the market and push the, push the game forward. You've also got the consumer forces. And I can say with absolute confidence that every single one of us in the room here today is using far more bandwidth than what we used last year, and the year before, and the year before that. As every year goes forward, we all use approximately about 50% more bandwidth. What's driving that? 
Because I'm pretty sure most of you are like me. None of us have made a conscious decision. We didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to use more bandwidth. What's really driving it, particularly on the consumer side of things, is a complex interplay that we see between application developers and the consumer electronic manufacturers. These are the things that consumers engage with. These are the things that change how you, consumers use the broadband that they purchase today. If we look at some examples of this, for example, we've got on screen there a notification from YouTube that came out earlier this year, where they announced support for live streaming at 4K resolution. Now, 12 months ago, live streaming was the preserve of the geeks in the industry. They used applications like Periscope and Meerkat and stuff like that, and most of us in the tech community knew about those, but the mass market absolutely didn't. Now, all of a sudden, we've got applications like YouTube, like Facebook, that now with one press of a button, you've got billions of users that are now able to live stream. You see that further supported with the consumer electronic industry where all our smartphones allow us to do that, and that's great, we can stand here in an event like this and hold our phone up for half an hour. Or you see the likes of wearables now coming into play. What you see there on the screen is a, a device from a company called Front Row. It's a wearable, you hang it around your neck, and when you go to events like this, you don't have to sit there holding your phone up all day. Facebook took it further a couple of weeks later and said, well, they're doing 4K, we're going to do 360 4K. So they now allow you to stream full 4K resolution with 360 degree field of view into Facebook. And if we look at the implications from the consumer electronics side of things, very quickly we started to see at this beginning of 2017, the component manufacturers beginning to recognize the growing trend for VR and VR in portable devices. So what you see on the screen there behind me is basically a camera module designed for going into smartphones that has both front and rear facing lenses so that you can capture in 360 VR. And we've already now got within the market the first handsets starting to appear in the Asian market that have this technology already embedded into it. Now if you think about the life cycle for smartphones, smartphones typically have about a two and a half year life cycle. So the amount of time it takes this to propagate down to the mass market is very, very short indeed. We also have a massive trend that's kicking off at the moment. And this trend is being backed by the biggest companies in the world, the biggest digital companies in the world. And that is the shift away from how we traditionally interact with compute technology, compute resources. Every one of you in this room can type like hell. We're all really good typers. What we've got here is the shift away from keyboards and mice into a world where everything is being driven by voice control. And these devices here, the cost point of this type of technology is really being democratized. We're now talking entry level price points. I, I was walking through Sydney Airport there yesterday, and I think for the latest devices coming out from Google, the Google Home Mini, I think it was like 70 Australian dollars or something like that. You know, so this is small beer. You can now begin to turn your home environment into a voice controlled, automated environment that gives you access to pretty much anything that's on the web, and you can control it with your voice. This represents the future of search and purchasing online as we go forward. And that's why you've got the likes of Amazon, the likes of Google, the likes of Apple, the likes of Microsoft, pumping across them all billions into this space. The youngest millennials that are growing up now at the moment, or Generation Z that are growing up at the moment, the two and three year olds, the likelihood is they'll never develop keyboard skills. Because the world they'll grow up into is a voice control world. We see this with the likes of companies like Toy Talk, who are now taking what are basic toys that our children use to learn and educate with, and they're now augmenting them with cloud capabilities. So all these devices that you see across the bottom here can come across as extremely intelligent, can interact with us on a verbal basis, but take away the connectivity, and they're dumb as bricks. Barbie returns to being the original Barbie that the ladies in the room grew up with, or the action men that the guys grew up with, typically. And I know there's some variations on that. So, but, um, but the reality is these are being enhanced by cloud connectivity. And they need very low latency cloud connectivity for the experience to be a positive experience. We've also got the shift towards robotics as well. Let's see if we can get clickers working. What you see on the screen there is a robot called Asimo. Most of you probably have seen them over the years. And Asimo uh, represents the culmination of 20 years of investment by Honda, one of the largest companies in the world. And you see the various iterations of Asimo over the years as these evolved. 
And it's a very sophisticated robot. It's a robot that you could bring into a room like this and it could navigate its way through the tables and not trip up and not step on people and so on and so forth. It takes all the information it senses around it, it feeds it into effectively a supercomputer on its back. And that then informs it on how it should maneuver itself. The challenge with ASIMO is hugely sophisticated, absolutely represents the future of robotics as we go forward, but the problem you've got with it is it's so expensive. All the components, the supercomputer that goes in, into that device, you can't buy ASIMO today, but you can lease them, and the lease price, price for them is 100,000 euro per month, to put it in perspective. So that's far from being democratized as a technology. What needs to happen with the likes of ASIMO is they absolutely need those compute resources, but they need to be shared. They need to be in the cloud and every device leveraging those same resources and then using very high capacity broadband connectivity, particularly upload, low latency upload connectivity, to take in the 3D sensing information that's needed to allow it to navigate and then have the compute resources calculate what it needs to do next. We also have the cloudification of everything. I'm not going to dwell on that for too long. Basically, everything that's software based is going to move to software as a service. We've known this for a long, long time. It's already happening. Most of the apps that we all use today, we pay some sort of monthly or yearly subscription towards it. The days of buying a piece of software and installing it, and that's the end of the commercial relationship, is largely gone. And if it's not gone today, it'll be gone in the next couple of years. So again, these all drive heavy dependencies on the broadband side of things. You also have the media forces. The media forces is where we're seeing the shift towards ever richer media content. So at the moment, it's 4K. As we go forward, we'll move on to 8K and so on and so forth. The graph behind me, what it shows is, by 2020, in the US and in the European markets, in the order of about 40% of households will already have a 4K TV set in the living room. So that adoption rate's rising pretty quickly. But it's not all just about the 4K TV sets. One of the challenges we have in the industry is when people are planning capacity, the dimension for one 4K TV in the living room, a couple of high def TVs dotted around the house, few tablets, few smartphones, and we're all done. The problem we've got now is the resolution on devices is increasing all the time. What you see on the screen behind me is one of the higher end tablets from Samsung this year. It's a 4K screen on it. This is common across multiple manufacturers now. The phone beside it, Sony launched this year at Mobile World Congress in February. It's got a 4K screen on it. Now why on earth would you need a 4K screen on a smartphone? It's not for sharper Netflix. If you look at the gaming industry, a huge portion of the revenues coming into the gaming industry come from the mobile gaming. And if you look at some of the sectors or some of the splits that are emerging within the gaming industry, virtual reality represents a huge part of that. And the smartphone manufacturers, they want to be the screen of choice, not just for your mobile needs, but also when you're engaging in virtual reality gaming, get this thing to work, um, they want to be the screen of choice. So if we look at virtual reality, the options that are available to engage in those environments, we can have the dedicated he headsets, which tend to be priced towards enterprise type applications. You know, if you look at it, you have 500, 600 bucks for the headset, a couple of grand for a decent computer as well to drive it. Whereas for consumers, the smartphone represents a really solid path into that space. For those in the room, just out of curiosity, who in the room's tried out virtual reality so far? I would imagine a high proportion of you, yeah. So, if you're anything like me, your experience initially would have been a big wow factor. Oh, this is cool, this thing reacts to me, this is brilliant, oh, look at that. But then, after a couple of minutes, once the novelty factor wears off, you begin to notice, hey, I can see pixels in this thing, and it's a bit bright, and it doesn't, it's not quite virtual reality, it's got some ways to go. If you look at what's happening in that space, the resolutions on the screens are increasing all the time. The human eye sees in 12K resolution, to put it in perspective. And to take down a full 360 frame so that when you look around and you get that seamless interaction, normally you've got a 120 degree field of view, so you need at least three times that for the size of the frame. So when you're at 12K resolution times three, you're up at 36K resolution per frame to get a real true virtual reality experience without the human eye being able to discern the difference. So to get a feel for where screen resolutions are moving towards, you need to think about that. We also have um, the whole augmented reality movement. If you look at some of the stuff that's coming out in the market now, it's really quite impressive. All the latest stuff that's coming out. Do you guys have IKEA here in Australia? So have you seen the latest IKEA app for, with the augmented reality capabilities? It's pretty impressive. 
Um, you've also got the likes of Amazon. Amazon have just made a shift into this space as well. So a lot of the products that you can buy on Amazon, you can now come along and say, oh, I like that vase, I'll put it on the table over there, I can twist it around, and you can really be, have, to have a completely different consumer experience versus what you can have today, or, you know, as of two weeks ago. So these things are all moving forward, they're all driving the need for more and more bandwidth. With all of this in the background, surely the answer has to be fiber at home. Fiber at home is the only thing that could deliver on those needs, surely. Well, let's have a look at what's going on in the fiber at home industry, just very briefly. Some of this is data from Fiber at Home Council Europe, which is being compiled by an organization that we use called iDate. Again, I want to stress I'm here in ad trans capacity today, not in my FTTH Council um, capacity. But this data is in the public domain, you can download it off the website, so it's fair game for anybody. And what we can see on the graph behind me is there is absolutely substantial growth going on in the European market. If we look at countries like Russia, countries like Spain, countries like France, the likes of Romania, Portugal, large, large investments going on, high levels of growth. That graph that's behind us there shows the homes passed over a number of different years for each, each country that you have there. So Russia and Spain in particular, huge advances going on there. So we have to really begin to think about what are they doing different? We're also seeing very strong take rate for those services as well. So particularly in the markets where historically there was only an ADSL service offering, and then all of a sudden we started to see a large proliferation of fiber to the home services, the take rates were very strong because there was pent up demand within the market. So hardly surprising. So again, the strong ones there, Russia, Spain, France, Romania, these are all countries that you don't have large scale rollouts of VDSL technology or Vectrum technology. The whole population was hanging off long loop ADSL services. So, you know, typically by the time you get to the end of those long loops, it might be five or ten meg type services, which if you think about all the applications I showed earlier, and remember, they're all applications that are there today. That's not future stuff. It's things that are in the market at the moment. Your five and ten megs really begins to struggle down at that point. When we think about this from a global perspective, it's very easy to understand why people might get frustrated, particularly here in the Australian market, when they look at some of the penetration rates that have been achieved around the world. You know, if I look at the UAE, for example, it's in the mid 90% penetration rate for fiber to home services. You can't ask yourself, you know, how are they doing that? Now, just out of curiosity, how many people in the audience have been to the UAE, been to Dubai in recent years? <coughs> Sprinkler. Well, one of the big benefits that the UAE has is, if you look at its housing stock, the graph that I show up there shows the number of large multi-dwelling units that have been built, large buildings, skyscrapers, that have been built over the last 50 years. And you can see very easily there from about 2000 onwards, there's been massive investment going on there. So there's been huge growth in the housing stock within that country. I remember when that was all kicking off back in the late 1990s, I was working for Marconi at the time, and we spent quite a bit of time in that region. And at that point, everything they were doing for new build was all fiber to the home. There was no in-between technology. They weren't interested in copper, they weren't interested in coax. It was fiber to the home back then. But they benefited hugely from that massive growth in new housing stock. And we heard from Bruno earlier when he spoke, and we hear it from every operator around the world. When there's a new build, when it's greenfield, you do fiber to the home, it's a no-brainer. But when it gets difficult, when you get to the hard stuff, the brownfield stuff, the retrofit stuff, that's where some of the real challenges emerge. But then when we go back to the graph that we had earlier, one of the things that we note is there are other countries in there that have achieved very high penetration. How are they doing that? You've got Qatar up there, for example, great example. But then if you know Qatar, Qatar, first of all, from a opulence point of view. Qatar has a GDP per capita that would make most of Australia look like they're in pure poverty. They've got three times the GDP per capita of what Australia has. <coughs> so a very wealthy nation. Couple that with the fact that they've got less than 150,000 homes, it's very easy to get those sort of penetration rates. But what I'm trying to highlight here is these are great graphs. They tell a great story and at a glance, people can feel left behind. But when you begin to delve into the detail, you know, if you look at the likes of Singapore and Hong Kong, and look at the population density per kilometer squared, you're up at 7,987 or 6,442. To put it in perspective, all of the major cities here in Sydney 
are less than 500 per, per kilometer squared. So you're talking more than a tenfold increase in density for population. So again, the guys from Korea spoke about it earlier. You know, a lot of people living in large MDUs, it becomes a lot easier to target those sort of scenarios with fiber. Also, the construct of the housing stock has a major role to play. I've highlighted Spain, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. Again, all big hitters on the European fiber of the home stage. But if you look at the construct of the housing behind me, the orange within the chart is residential units as part of multi-dwelling units, so the percentage within the overall. So the, the overall chart shows 100% of the housing stock in each country. The blue line shows detached single, uh, single dwelling units, and the yellow at the very top shows semi-detached single dwelling units. So if you look at the construct of Spain, one of the leaders in the European fiber of the home market, they also have the largest percentage of population living in large multi-dwelling units. So you can really begin to get a little bit of insight as to what's driving their market. But then you've got some outliers like Romania. We saw Romania on the previous charts doing really well. I think it was number four in Europe. So you know they've got a huge portion of single dwelling units. So how are they doing it? You know, there must be something unique to them. And this is where I want people to really kind of look behind the brochure side of things, okay? Um, this is my fourth time, I think, in Sydney now at this stage. And, you know, one of the things I notice here, or in Melbourne when I've been there as well, they're lovely cities. And as I was walking around yesterday, you know, I had this slide already built, and I was picturing, you know, one of the phrases that I saw, I think it was a speaker from Vodafone present at one of the industry conferences there recently, was this new concept. I don't know if Tony from MBN's in the room, you know, this could really help solve a lot of the problems here. Fibre to the tree, as in the trees with the leaves outside. Because if you look at Romania, that's what they do. A lot of the build that's going on, how they get to a lot of those single dwelling units, they chain fibre from tree to tree or from pole to pole. The build standards, the build quality, is very different to what you would tolerate here in Australia, or what most of the advanced world would tolerate. In a similar fashion in Russia, you see cables chaining from building to building and up stairwells and all sorts of unorthodox approaches. It's really good at driving very fast penetration, but I'd be interested to see what their stability figures are with regard to service. In a similar fashion, we see the likes of Barcelona. Right? Not just Barcelona, all across Spain. For those of you that have holiday in Spain, it, this is where culture really comes into play. Because when you go to Spain, it's normal practice to run cables along the fronts of buildings. So the, te the traditional copper telecom network was built that way for many, many years in all the major cities. And now what they've done is the fiber network is being built the exact same way. So if you think about it, Bruno spoke about this earlier. We talked about you know, the mayors in Germany. And I, I spent a lot of time in Germany with a big team over there. And you know, the, the, the German towns and cities are built to a very, very high standard there. They would absolutely balk the idea of running cables along the front of buildings and chaining across the road and all that sort of stuff. It just simply would not be tolerated. But Bruno, how much faster would you be able to build out your network if you could do that stuff? At a fraction of the cost, you know? But unfortunately, these are cultural constraints that we've got to deal with. The other option is you take the Dubai approach and just build whole, whole new cities and make everything new built. Then it becomes a whole lot easier as well. So the, 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 the real thing I wanted to flag there is, there's a lot of outliers. We see these graphs and you, you know, people can easily go, oh, we're doing terrible on a global stage. But when you look behind what's behind the bar and the bar chart, begin to delve into it. There's unique circumstances in many of the scenarios that are just simply not portable to other countries. They're special and specific to that country. And that's something we've all got to keep in the back of our mind. And that's why we need a multi-technology approach. And if you think back over the evolution of broadband access since its inception, we've always had a multi-technology approach. We've always had a mix of copper technology and cable technology and fiber of the home in certain places, as well as wireless technology. It's always been there from the inception. As we move forward, if we look at where we're at in the industry today, roughly within that circle, we're in that overlap in many of the advanced markets where we're moving in that area between the ultra-fast service offerings, the technologies that can deliver that, so your vectored media cells, your super vectoring, your DOCSIS 3.0, your GPOM <coughs> technologies, and we're now moving towards the gigabit society type technologies as well. And that's where we move on to GFAS, DOCSIS 3.1, your 10 gig PON derivatives, and on the wireless side of things, millimeter wave. 
And this becomes very important because with my fiber to the home hat, I get a lot of joy out of this particular slide because all of these technologies are really, unless they're all the way to the premises like full fiber to the home is, they're really distribution point or pit type technologies um, that, that you'll have there. And without major fiber densification, these will not become a reality. In a similar fashion, 5G that Steve spoke about earlier, without major fiber densification, 5G won't become a reality either. So I think they go hand in hand. It's, it's wrong to position fiber of the home against these other technologies. They're very complementary there. Yeah, I'll do a talk later on latency. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, if anyone wants to understand the importance of latency, stand up here in front of an audience and have a clicker that has a lag on it, it puts a new perspective on it. Um, one of the things we also need to think about, as we're moving towards these next generation technologies, the fifth generation of access technologies, how we roll out services needs to change. If you think about the traditional approach within telecom of everything being monetized towards the consumer and everything being provided by the telco, that model's dead now. The over-the-top guys are taking all the traditional services, all the voice calling, the messaging, you know, TV services, and they're delivering it on the back of broadband connections that the carriers have to provide. They've got to pay for that data connectivity to deliver those services to consumers. And the challenge that I frequently hear around the world is the consumers, you know, they've got an elastic spend, and in many markets, they're hitting the peak of that elastic spend. So how can you get more money? I've got to invest all this money to upgrade the network and deliver gigabit service, but where's the money going to come from to pay for that investment? And that's where we need to move to much more of a symmetric control type environment, where it's not just the operator of the network that controls the network, but they, through standardized API interfaces, can allow the providers of over-the-top services, users of over-the-top services, to control the network, to deliver higher capacity when it's needed, to deliver guaranteed SLAs when they're required. And when I talk about over the top, you know, it's easy to default to Netflix and Amazon Prime, but like I think about as we go forward in the future, I showed the robotics stuff and I talked about the importance of getting its control and its compute resources up into the cloud. But that has to have very, very low latency in order for that service to work. Or we've got cloud-based software as a service. And you've got salespeople out there trying to convince IT managers to jettison that server that he's had in his comrade room for years and give them guarantees that the experience for his staff will be the same if they shift those software functions up into the cloud. Or you've got people managing remote equipment using haptic feedback to try and control that equipment. And one of the things, you know, when we look with our site, we see kind of at a rate of about 50 or 60 hertz per second. When it comes to touch and sensing and being able to react to that, that's thousands of times per second. So much, an order of magnitude quicker. So again, in order to make that a reality, in order to make that a reality, we need to be able to put in controls that the network can sense what type of application is going across it and adjust accordingly on behalf of the users. Or even if it's just lowering the latency so VOR users don't end up getting you know, motion sickness um, when they're in their living rooms. To close, ultimately, our vision within Adtran is we need to move to a world where it's a symmetric software-defined access environment. And I don't just mean symmetric on the bandwidth side of things. That's equally important. It's really symmetric on the control side of things. We need to move to an environment where not just the user can control the network, but also the applications can control the network and talk directly to it without human intervention in between. So just some closing thoughts. The drivers for gigabit society are very real. We're getting pushes from many different fronts, and there's a lot of pulls coming from the consumer side of things as well. It's not just about higher resolution video. Multiple gigabit mediums are going to be required to deliver on this vision of gigabit society. If we hold out for full fiber of the home, the best example I can think of is France at the moment. If I look at France, France is rolling out fiber of the home at a rate of 2 million homes connected per year. That's some pelt. The problem is, the last guy, who's currently on an ADSL connection, has another 13 years to go before he's going to get his connection because there's 30 million households in France, to put it in perspective. Without fiber densification, there's going to be no gigabit society and there's definitely not going to be any 5G. And ultimately, open source SDN control is going to be a key. It's foundational to all the new services. We heard about it from the others with network slicing, etc. It's critical for service innovation as we go forward. Thank you.
thanks for joining and uh, well done for uh, sticking with the clicker.